thanks for coming to uh, thanks for coming to the Independent Game Summit. I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Jen Sandercock, who's going to talk about focusing your indie career. Let's give her a warm hand of applause. Hi. Um, hopefully you can hear me here. I was going to stand there, but then I realized all you'd see was my head, so I thought I would stand over here instead. Um, so yes, I'm obviously Jen Sandercock, um, and I'm going to begin with a little story. Once upon a time, once upon a time, I didn't make games. Um, I used to work at the Australian Department of Defence doing air operations research. I then uh, switched to do a master's in artificial intelligence at, um, and I was looking at how to create diverse character personalities in sort of very academic games. Um, I sort of thought I wanted to do games, but I was like, oh, games isn't a real career, or, you know, that's not going to be a thing. And then when I sort of realized games was a real career, I'm like, oh, well, I'm like coding, maybe I should be a coder. And I met a bunch of people who are a lot better at coding than I was, and so I was like, oh, well, that's not so good, and I don't know if I necessarily enjoy coding that much to do it full time. I then had an epiphany. I'm a game designer. I'm not really a coder. I can code, but it's not, you know, what I'm best at. So I set out, uh, I gave myself a new goal. I just wanted to get experience in games. Um, and thus began my non-indie games career. Uh, the first job that I had in the games industry, um, I got, uh, I'd gone for the interview and then I got the call that I, you know, they wanted me to take the job. It was uh, working on LA Noir for Team Bondi um, as a junior game designer working on the tutorial levels. The, uh, the company reputation wasn't particularly good, um, shall I say politely, um, but at the time my only goal was to get experience. Um, and then I sort of looked a little deeper at the game as well, and L.A. Noir, although it's sort of a first-person shooter, it's also an adventure game, and I love adventure games. Um, it's also set in the 1940s, which is a period of time I very much like. Um, and also, it was a contract position, so I knew it wasn't going to be forever. So I took the job, I worked at um, L.A. Noir, we shipped the game, awesome. Um, and then next, I went to work on a little educational game that was teaching Australian 12, 13-year-olds how to um, teach them English. I, it was a relatively small team, and I ended up having quite a bit of responsibilities. Um, I somehow became somewhat the lead game designer on the team, and then I was doing some producer stuff, and I just didn't feel like I had the experience to have such a role. I wanted to learn from other people. Um, so I packed up and uh, moved from the USA, moved to the USA from Australia, um, because I felt like at the time the Aussie industry wasn't going to give me that experience that I wanted. I uh, started working for Disney Playdom on some hidden object games, um, and hidden object games are also sort of adventure games somewhat. And then, um, and then I quit my job. I quit my job because I had a boss who was making me feel really miserable. I was crying a lot of the time, and even though quitting meant that I might have to leave the country, I was like, there has to be something more, I shouldn't be crying so frequently. I, uh, I stopped to kind of look around at my career and I sort of felt like it had been plateauing. I wasn't really sure where I was going. I wasn't really making progress. I'd uh, worked on a bunch of different genres, um, but like nothing was really holding it all together. Now, I didn't really know what I was going to do about that, how to make that work at all, but I did have an idea for a game. So I thought, great, I'm going to work on this game. And so I went indie. Um, so hopefully the majority of people here are indies. And being indie is basically freedom. It's uh, freedom to make whatever I want. I can work on whatever genre I want to. I can kind of work with whoever I want to because I don't have to work with somebody I don't like. Um, and the big problem is there's a bunch of creative decisions that you've got to make. Um, you know, there's all this freedom, you can do whatever you want, what will you do? So my uh, first decision was what is my game company all about? What is Inquisiment Inc. that I had just founded going to be all about? So I created a list of my core values. 
And I'm just going to pause for a moment here because you might have noticed that art is not one of my skills. Um, and so this, this little image here is supposed to somewhat be like a sphere and then there's like a hole in it and that's like where your core values go. So just thought I'd better explain that because it may not be obvious from just looking at that picture. Anyway, I created a list of my core values. It was basically three things that I wanted in the games that I was working on. I wanted to make games that foster friendship, curiosity, and challenge. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, so friendship to me is about, I think that people in the world are pretty lovely people. Sure, there's some not great people, but I want to be reminded of the nice people in the world. Um, there's a bunch of games out there where it's somewhat violent, you're going around killing people, and I didn't want that in a game. I wanted a game that rather either within the game itself, was talking about um, friendship so that you would have a new understanding of ways you can have friendship, or a game that outside of the game was encouraging you to be better friends with the people, your friends you have in the real world. I want to work on games that foster curiosity. So I think the world is pretty amazing. I think we can create amazing um, digital worlds as well. And yet a lot of games kind of just push you through. They're like, do this, do this, keep going, don't stop and look at the sunset, blah, go, go. And so I want to work on games where, you know, you're somewhat encouraged to take your time and explore. There's a bunch of different options and there's not really big penalties if you choose one over the other. I want to work on games that foster challenge. Um, so there are a lot of games out there that aren't necessarily super like gamey. They don't have a set of game rules and you don't necessarily win or lose. But I like games that make me feel like I've accomplished something and done something. Um, and so that's what I, uh, that's what I say when I, I say challenge. So I explicitly listed out my core values. This is a picture of me at my, uh, the little office space that I had at the time. And initially it was just meant for my current game, uh, Glimpse Friends, that I was starting work on. But then I realised I could apply these core values to a lot more. So this is kind of where we get to the guts of the talk. We're gonna, I'm going to talk to you about how using your core values can answer a bunch of questions that are going to come up um, while you're developing games and in your career. Um, and I'm going to use some examples of how I've used them. So for example, you might ask, what feature should I implement next? Should I implement multiplayer? or a new level, or maybe local co-op, or perhaps some like quality animations like this. I mean, is this not quality? <laughs> Wouldn't your game be better with this? Um, or perhaps in-app purchases, or, you know, smell a vision um, So I am going to give an example of my game, A Glimpse Friends. So in A Glimpse Friends, it's a mobile phone game where you are taking photos and sending challenges to friends. So basically, a friend might have sent me this challenge, um, something that makes you smile, beginning with E. And I would go out in the world and I would go, ooh, here's Alamo Square and some elegant houses. Um, I would take a photo of that and then I would create a challenge to send back to my friend and we would go back and forwards. Um, so it was about taking photos and exploring the, the real world, looking up from your phone. So when I was working on it, I had a decision between what feature should I put in next. Should I put in messaging with friends from within the game so that you could say, hey, sorry about that last photo, it was tough or wasn't that funny? Um, or should I put in um, offline mode so that you could play it like on the airplane or wherever you were? So because I want a game that fosters friendship, curiosity and challenge, Online, off, offline mode doesn't really do that at all. So I didn't implement that. Another big question you might ask is, how can I market my game? So what are the key themes of the game? Uh, which con or expo should I go to? Uh, what social media platforms should I be posting on? Should I just put on a sandwich board and walk around GDC? Or maybe I should like beg press to you know, be nice to me? Uh, should I be targeting teens or 50-year-old women? Uh, should I be, for my merchandise, should I be making posters or t-shirts or like underwear? Who knows? So in my example, I work on a game called Thimbleweed Park. It's an adventure game in the style of Lucasfilm games. Um, so some of the games that came out in the late 80s and early 90s. 
It's a single player game, but when I was younger, I remember playing adventure games with my brother and sister, and it was very much about my friendship with them and, and working together to solve these puzzles. So when it came to, I had to create a booth for us at, um, at PAX, um, I, I set up the booth so that they had two stools per station and also had two sets of headphones. And this was so that people could sit next to each other and take their time to play. So it's a single player game, but I'm adding friendship into the game. Uh, so another big question you will ask is, uh, what game should I work on next? Should I work on a zombie shooter, or an arty walking simulator, or maybe a kid-friendly indie darling, uh, an audio-only game, or a light-hearted political game, because politics is light-hearted, not? <laughs> um, so, you're, I mean, like most game developers, you probably have a lot of ideas of what you want to work on next, but many of these will not fit your core values. So, for example, back in 2013, I did a project, a personal project for myself where every month for the year I came up with a different gameplay mechanic and I implemented it. So one of the goals of the game was to actually implement games and feel like I was doing something. Um, another goal was that I, was, I wanted to make games that gave me hugs. And when I say hugs, I'm, I don't necessarily mean physical hugs, although they're lovely. I kind of meant that feeling of being accepted for who I am and being loved. Um, so I created these 12 games um, and they all gave me hugs to some extent or less. But if I'm considering, like they were all somewhat small games because I did them within a month and it was just one gameplay mechanic in each, uh, in each one. So how do they rate if I'm now considering, should I work on one of these more? Should I build it out to be something big, bigger? How are they going with friendship, curiosity and challenge? So, for example, uh, my first game was just a little game that you uh, played on the back of business cards that I could hand out at GDC. It's sure, it was about friendship because I was making friends by handing these cards to people, but it wasn't really about curiosity. Uh, the next game I did was a game where two people are on the same keyboard and they're you know, trying to navigate their little characters in sync with the other person. Again, about friendship, but there wasn't really anything curious about it. Uh, the next game I did was one of my first edible games, so a game where you eat the pieces. Um, in this game, you would actually, um, you, you know, you'd be around a table, you would compete for um, ingredients, and then you would make cookies and eat the cookies at the end. So it was definitely about friendship, because you're eating cookies with friends, and that's what friends are about. Uh, but it wasn't really about curiosity, other than is this going to taste super gross or nice? Um, but by the time I look at this uh, fourth game, uh, Marie's Mr. Right, um, this one does meet all of my criteria. The game itself is a little text-based game where you get one line of the story at a time, and you need to decide whether that line of story is important to remember or not. If it is important and you remember it, then the story will branch differently and you'll end up with different endings. So it's about friendship because it's about this woman um, deciding whether she should be staying with her boyfriend or whether he's really just a friend and um, not a romantic interest at all. It's about curiosity because you're just sort of exploring these like weird little paths and seeing what happens. Um, and it's about challenge because it's actually very difficult to get what I call the happy ending. Um, so I can keep going through and looking at uh, all of the other games and kind of rating them. So there's like a, a game where you're, you've got uh, Dixit cards, you're telling stories. I did an audio only game because people said they liked the sound of my voice. Um, I worked with a team of other people on a game about, uh, we've got like a comic strip and you're, you're editing what people will say. Uh, this game, the AI with a broken heart, was basically about breakups, and this was not about friendship. It made me feel horrible. It was very depressing, and I learned I do not like to work on depressing games. Um, so keep you on going through. You know, there's uh, this is one of my favourites, Dragon Whisperers. This is a game where you you're sitting next to somebody else, and you each have half of a dictionary, and you're trying to work out what the dragon's saying to you. It was a game where um, there's two sisters dividing up uh, the, what their father has left them in his will. And then there was a very stressful game which was about driving on the road and calling out guesstimate and being wrong. And it was not a good game. 
Anyway, um, in summary, 50% of these games are not suitable for me to work on currently with the current set of core values that I have. So that's great. I don't need to consider the other ones. So pushing this idea further, back in late 2009, I did another personal project where I came up with a different game idea every week for the course of the year. Now, I didn't implement these games. They were just game ideas. And that created these 52 ideas. Um, and then if I now go through and consider the lens of friendship, curiosity, and challenge, I can kind of you know, mark each one and go, yep, tick, tick, cross, cross, whatever. And in the end, there's only 17 that would fit my core values of friendship, curiosity, and challenge. That's under 33% of those games would be suitable for me to work on now. Um, so another big question that one might ask uh, that core values can help you with is who should I work with? Should I work with a team of 20 people? Should I work by myself or with some billionaire who's going to pay me tons of money? Or should I like work with my best mate? Um, the important thing to note is that other people don't need to share your core values. You need to talk to the other person about your core, uh, what your core values are and then you need to ask, am I going to need to compromise my core values to work with this person? Are your core, both of your own individual core values compatible? So all of the decisions that you've been making kind of lead up to this, how do I build a legacy of games that I'm proud of? How do I create like an oeuvre of work, a portfolio, or whatever you want to call it? How do you kind of get that coherence, like you're really um, making something bigger and making progress? And it's kind of what I was lacking before. So, well, the answer is pretty simple. You just follow your core values because if you follow your core values, you'll end up having games that all have something very much in common. They'll have those core values in common and they'll feel like a wholeness. So let me talk a bit about uh, some of the games that I've worked on since I came up with my core values. So A Glimpse Friends, as I said, was about, um, it's about staying in touch with your friends. So it's definitely about friendship. Um, it's about curiosity because I'm encouraging you to put your phone down and look at the world. And it's about challenge because you're actually sending individual challenges to people. Now, this game was a total and absolute financial failure. I spent like two years of my life on it. Um, I hardly had any downloads. I made like, it was, it was financially terrible. But I am like super proud of this game. This game is very much the epitome of friendship, curiosity, and challenge. So that brings me to a side benefit. If your game fails, but you followed your core values, at least you can kind of feel okay about yourself. You may not feel great because your game's failed, but you're not gonna like, hate yourself in the sense that, hey, I did something that I didn't really like and it failed and wow. So another game uh, I've been working on uh, since I came up with my core values is Thimbleweed Park. And as I said, it's not really about friendship within the game because it's a single player game and the story itself is about two agents who don't like each other in a weird town. Um, but it's about the people playing it uh, and, and the way that you play it. So we've brought in a bunch of playtesters and we often bring in like a couple to playtest. And what's fascinating is that since only one person can control the mouse, the other person often doesn't even necessarily notice that they're not controlling the mouse. They feel like they're part of the game and they're contributing just by saying, hey, how about you try combining this or doing this? The game is definitely about curiosity because there's a bunch of like really pretty um, environments and, and places to explore. There's a library that's filled with over a thousand books to read, and the game does it like you know lets you take your time with it. Um, and it's about challenge because there's a lot of puzzles in it, um, adventure game puzzles, and they're adventure game puzzles that uh, kind of respect you. They're not super obtuse. Um, so I've been doing a series of edible games um, and there's a lot of things that you could do with food that aren't really very friendly. For example, I could make people eat really gross things or have people competing a lot more um, for food so that you're backstemming each other. But I choose not to make games like that in my series because I really want to have games that are encouraging people to actually like the other people around them. Um, in terms of curiosity, many of the games themselves aren't super about curiosity, but for me, while I'm coming up with all these games, I'm like, ooh, what can I do with food? And so I'm really exploring my own curiosity. And I always try to make sure that the games actually have challenge, so you're not just sitting down and eating food, you have to earn the right to be able to do that. 
So for example, one of the games I came up with is called Gingerbread Friends. It's a slow game about getting to know friends and asking these very awkward questions of people. Um, I showed this at uh, Baby Castles in New York, and one uh, group of people who were playing were mostly strangers before the start of the game. And then by the end, they were exchanging contact details and had basically become friends, which seemed perfect to me. Um, this game, The Order of the Oven Mitt, um, the game itself doesn't uh, say that you have to pay, play cooperatively or competitively. It's totally up to you and the friendship that you have with the people you're playing with. Um, it's, it was fascinating. I showed it at XOXO and I think absolutely everybody at that festival um, played cooperatively. They were like, hey, which things do you like best? If, if I give you that, will you help me have this other candy that I like? Um, whereas other places I've showed it, uh, people have been a little bit uh, less friendly, but still generally pretty friendly. It's about eating cookies, that's friendly. So by now, I bet you're thinking, hey, Jen, these cool values sound like super awesome. Um, but Jen, I'm not really into friendship, curiosity, and challenge. It's not really my bag. That is Totally cool. You need to come up with core values that work for you. So how do you do that? You basically come up with a big list of a whole bunch of words that might mean something to you. Maybe you want to have a sense of empowerment. Uh, maybe you want to create amazing cinematic art. Uh, maybe you just want to have a sense of joy. So you basically list out all the things that you could possibly care about. You then start bunching them down into groups. And then once you've got those groups, you try to pull out one like word that might mean most of the stuff in that group. And you try to reduce it right down to the bare minimum. Three is a nice number. Uh, and you're aiming to make it really short and memorable, um, partly so you can remember it yourself, but also so you can tell other people, so you can you know, be, hey, I'm doing this thing, and it's awesome. Uh, you need to update your core values regularly. Life changes, you can change, and your values can change too. Now, sometimes you've got to do a project that compromises your core values because you need to pay rent. You should totally pay rent and be able to eat. That's super important. Um, you shouldn't, you know, core values come on top of, like, the basics of living. Sometimes you want to work on a project that isn't really 100% uh, in line with your core values, but you, maybe you want to do it for, you want more experience, or you want to do a favour for a friend, or perhaps you just want a little extra money would be nice. And that can also be okay too. But you need to be making that decision consciously. If the compromise that you're making on your core values is minor or the timeline is pretty short, then sure, that's fine. But if you're making like serious compromises on your core values, maybe you need to check to see if your core values need to change or you might end up pretty miserable. Because, you know, at the end of, day, of the day, being indie should be about freedom. If it isn't, you're doing something wrong. So in summary, you should find your core values, list them out explicitly, use them, believe them, and live them, update them as life changes. Uh, so just follow your core values, make amazing games you're proud of, and yeah, that is all. Don't forget to fill in evaluations so I can come back some other time. Do we, do we have, I think we've got time for questions. Any questions? Not so much. Oh no, somebody's coming up. Wait. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. And did you um, update your core value along the way? You talked about the updating your core value, right? Mm -hmm. So have you done that? Yeah, well, so I guess uh, initially my core value was just, I just wanted experience. And so that was all I cared about when I was starting out in the industry. And so now I have my friendship, curiosity, and challenge. If I find that's not working for me, then I will, I will definitely reconsider and, and change what's, what I'm doing. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>